life. <laughs> Thank you, Podcast Hitler. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I'm Theo. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. And welcome from Scotland. From Scotland. Yay. <laughs> Well, That's, thank really. you, thank you for that. Scotland I, the Brave, really. It's the first one you go to. I, oh, I gotta bounce that. <laughs> you're getting put on the first flight home tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're, you're banned now from Scotland. <laughs> Thanks, man. Maybe, Thanks. Maybe I'll just sleep in the garage. <laughs> so yes, we are in Scotland, far away, 3,000 miles from home, 3,000 kilometers, something like that. It's very far. Um, 6,000 kilometers, yeah. It's very rainy. Um, it's otherwise lovely. This is... Theo, who you have seen, you may have seen before. I don't remember what order these podcasts go up in. We anymore. didn't. We didn't know a podcast. I was in last year. Yes, you have been. You were definitely in the not a podcast last year when you visited us, and now we are visiting you. Yeah. He has been gracious enough to host us, and uh, we we've been here for four days. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we were recording this. It is it is Monday, the something, uh, when this goes up. And we were recording literally the night before, so uh, I'm going to be super cranky tomorrow because I've been up all night editing this. <laughs> but apart from that, uh, Scotland is wonderful. Mm. I recommend that you visit. I don't recommend that you live here. Hey! Some of us have for 27 years. Thank Some you of us lot. have to because they won't let us live anywhere else. <laughs> hey! Cheek. Sure. Um, ultimately, Icebreaker. What is, because you traveled transatlantically uh, last year to visit us and also mm-hmm. have a number of other times going to uh, lots of other places, mm-hmm. America and Tokyo and mm-hmm. numerous places around the world. Now, this is my this was my first transatlantic flight ever, and I believe it was yours as well, Ryan? No, it was my second. Right, I, right. You I, went to Kenya. I went to Kenya almost 10 years ago, yeah. so, uh, but basically it was the first time in a long time. So, um, the icebreaker is, what is... The sort of funny thing you notice about uh, transatlantic travel. Like, you can take a plane, you know, in the continental uh, North America or Europe or wherever, and, and things are sort of different than, like, spending six or seven hours locked in a plane crossing an ocean. Am I going first? You are now. Okay. Um, now my thing is um, the accents. Like, when I, I traveled to you guys last year, saying in the airport... But in the run up to it, obviously accents like mine were the accents we heard. It's, it's what we heard. But it turned out, I found out about two seconds after getting on the plane, seventy percent of the passengers on my flight were Canadians going home from a visit. <laughs> and it was it was really strange because I was just like all the Scots seemed to be sort of stuck together in this little block in the middle of the plane. So I was surrounded by Scottish accents, but I could hear like the Canadians talking, also talking to the air crew and talking to each other, whatever. And then and the weird thing happens after sort of six or seven hours stuck in the same place, you sort of tune into accents and it becomes normal. By the end of the flight, the Scottish accent sounded really odd and off. And I kept hearing myself like, I'm speaking the wrong language. Something's happened. I'm broken. What happened? <laughs> and like, I found myself starting to like really slow down. So by the time I came to see you guys, I kind of acclimatized to the accent already. And I'd slowed down a bit. Like, I went through customs and the guy understood me first time, which has never happened going anywhere else. So it was, yeah, it was it was really strange. So, like, but then coming back, it was the same thing. Like, I, I was so used to Canadian accents, and I was hearing Scottish accents coming back. By the time I came back, I, my accent sounded a bit more normal again. But, yeah, the, the accents on a plane is a very strange thing. Like, but then going to Europe is different languages, so it's slightly different. But, yeah. Right. The thing I noticed about uh, transatlantic flight... And I suppose it's all flights, but um, when I talk to people about trans- transatlantic flights in particular, or just any g- giant body of water you're flying over, yeah. is people have uh, an equally rational and irrational fear of flying. <laughs> when, I, when I say rational, yes, um, you're seceding all um, control. And you have absolutely no no ability to affect the flight. Um, and if it does go down, you are going to probably not survive. So, I mean, there's, there's a rational side to it. But otherwise, um, it's fairly irrational because statistically flying is the safest mode of travel. And just in general, it's people, they don't understand the dangers of driving. 
Um, yeah. And they tend to think that, uh, whether it's because they're in control or not, but they don't realize that the physics involved in crashes in terms of speeding and, and, and hitting objects. Um, and so they tend to, I think, overestimate the likelihood that they're going to walk away from a car accident. Where they, they, they generally appreciate just how dangerous crashing a plane would be, but for a car, I don't think they actually realize how dangerous it is. Um, and so it's, I mean, it's morbidly funny, I, I suppose, but when I, when I speak to people about flying over oceans and stuff, there's that worry that, you know, the plane's going to somehow go down, which in reality, you know, there's planes, like thousands of planes launching every day around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we only fixate on plane crashes in the media because that's what the media does is it picks out those horrific events. Um, but the irrational feel that fear that people have about flying um, is something that I'm slightly amused about, given how I know people drive. <laughs> it's like um, there's all those security policies where it's like you know the the the, the president and the vice president can't get on the same plane because mm-hmm. then if it goes down, but they can get in the same car. Yeah, <laughs> which yeah. is just orders of magnitude more dangerous. Yeah. Um, what about you, Jim? Yeah, uh, the funny thing I noticed. So I, I love airports and I love flying, and I don't do it very often, but it just it entertains me to no end. Uh, but the thing that really sort of I find hilarious and fascinating is flight delays and people's reaction to flight delays. So we our, our flight out of, we flew out of uh, O'Hare and uh, to Edinburgh. And our flight was delayed by a couple hours because they needed to replace a part um, for a light. And that goes back to the this flying being the safest thing. Is that when you're ca- in your car, when your check engine light comes on, you're like... Uh, on a plane, when the check engine light comes on, they do not move until <laughs> they have fixed it. They're like, we are going literally nowhere until we have had an actual mechanic in to check this thing over mm-hmm. um, and fix the problem. So, uh, we, yeah, we, we, were, we were on the ground for a couple hours, um, which was kind of fun because we still had movies and stuff on the plane. And they mm-hmm. offered us the chance to, like, get off and... And that is, that is a minor delay when it comes to flights. Mm-hmm. But there are people who are like, man, I'm really just, I'm supposed to, you know, I, I, I want to get where I'm going. I got to, I'm like, you're about to fly like a bird over an entire ocean. 50 years ago, you know, we're, we're, we're what, 1966? Mm-hmm. Transatlantic flights are barely a thing, if at all. Mm-hmm. Like fifty years ago, this would have you know sixty years ago, this would have taken a ship, and it would have taken you like at least a month mm-hmm. to cross this ocean. You, you know, I mean, and if your ship is lost at sea, like if one of the many things that can go wrong with your with your ship storms, etc., you are gone. No one remembers you. You don't have a black box. You just sort of disappear one day. Um, but planes, like like two hours, three hours, five hours. I'm like, I, I can amuse myself for five hours for the sake of shortening a, what would be a month-long journey or an impossible journey to less than a day. To, to what was our flight? Like six and a half hours, something like that. Yeah. Flying through the air at 500 miles an hour. Yeah. Like, that is unbelievably magnificent. (laughs) And the notion that, like, but I'm delighted at the notion that it is a thing that inconveniences us. That we're like, oh, well, you know, we like, we've gotten to the point where we take it so much for granted that delays in the godlike bird sky car. Just inconvenience us. We're like, oh. like people roll their eyes when they're like, "It's going to be a couple hours." Like it's going to be if if you went back, you know, 150 years until the Wright brothers is like, "Listen, it's going to take you a couple more hours, but we're going to get this. We're going to get this this bus full of people off the ground and across the Atlantic Ocean." They'd be like, "Are you a wizard? <laughs> what did you do to our invention?" Yeah. Oh, man. I would yeah. like to share one super brief anecdote about the flight. <laughs> um, when So when we were trying to take off, um, we had a essentially check engine light that went off. They needed a part, 
and then the part that they replaced didn't work, and so the mechanic had to come back and try swapping out the circuit board with the original part to see if it was just a faulty circuit board, which turns out apparently that was. And then on top of that, the captain apologized because we wouldn't be able to take off until the paperwork was finished. Yeah. And then on top of that, because we were delayed, a storm blew over us, and there was lightning. And by by their policies, no ground crew are allowed to be on the tarmac when lightning is present, which meant we had no signal persons to help us back <laughs> out of our terminal in order to start uh, taxiing to, to the runway. So that meant that we were going absolutely nowhere until at the very least the lightning disappeared. So you have all these things compounding, and then the captain keeps coming on and he keeps apologizing, and they're telling us jokes and stuff to be happy, and people are, are not happy. Plus, they're not happy because they know deep down in the back of their mind that when we take off, it's going to be perhaps a rough takeoff because when even though there's no lightning, there's still a storm outside. Mm-hmm. And so, and there were so there's some people who are angry, but they're also scared. And there was this woman that was one row up and across the aisle from us. And so Jim made a comment, you know, because we were trying to be funny and, you know, we're Canadians in Chicago. And we're, try- we're trying to keep a, 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 an open mind about this. And, and Jim made that comment that we are literally about to fly like gods. I'm, try- I'm trying to imitate his, his delivery. But he essentially said that. And, he, and, he, and he, so he said his, his piece... And then a short while later, a woman, one row up and across the aisle, turns and taps on him. And she says she says something effective. Thank you very much for saying this. It made me feel so much better when, when you <laughs> said that. Essentially, like, cutting through the tension. And he was able to, to bring a level of, of perspective to an already tense situation. They had forgotten so, about that. Yeah, yeah. so, so uh, Jim magically... Or perhaps just empathetically was able to help out people around him. Because the woman beside us, I thought she didn't like flying. No, she just didn't like turbulence. Because we had a fair amount of non-aggressive but steady turbulence for a good chunk of the way until we got over, say, Quebec. And then once we got over the ocean, then it it essentially went away um, until we got over land again. Um, And so, so the woman beside, like you could tell she was very uncomfortable uh, I, I just thought she was uncomfortable because it was two very large guys sitting next to her because it was three abreast. Yeah, we don't fit well on planes. No, we didn't think to... Like, when it was yeah. just the two of us... Uh, <laughs> our, like... Yeah, our first leg of the trip from, from Toronto Chicago to Chicago, it was two seats per side of the aisle. So it was just Jim and I crashed into each other. Which was fine. We're, we were comfortable with that. But as soon as we saw there was three seats and there was this tiny woman... She was this so tiny cool. one, Na- Nancy was so tiny, and like she was the kind of person that she could like fold herself up and bring her feet onto her seat and like hug her knees. Like uh, she must be do yoga or something like that. She's just incredibly flexible, and I was so envious of of her being able to do that. Meanwhile, I am just jammed into the seat, trying my best not to like let my leg cramp. Right, and so she was she was noticeably. Um, uncomfortable and i just associated with us being you know two big guys and <laughs> she's jammed up against the window but no it turns out that it was not the flying she had a problem with it was the turbulence and mm. the, that that caused her some some um discomfort so so jim in his kind way was able to bring <laughs> some comfort to the people around him i also like that they like they explained everything they're like yeah you know we're missing a part and this is the part and i'm like i i work in software support like i have to explain to people why like that things are going wrong and knowing that they will not understand the specifics of that thing it is part of what i have to do sometimes and they gave us way more information than i would give people like just because it it does us no good to know that they have to go and resolder the board and, and whatever it's like this is this is you know we are we are working on it. This is how much time it will take. That is what I would have. That is what I would have given everybody, mm-hmm. because that is the thing they care about. But they were like, no, they're just they're just making conversation, and it was a good time. Can and I just f- say I was super annoyed you were delayed because I am not a morning person, and I had to buy my dad a coffee and sit and try and chat to him in the airport while we waited for you. Oh yeah, yeah. So thank you for that. Theo picked us up at the airport, uh, and we were two hours late. Also, <laughs> I did. Uh, before we move on, I did want to tack on one additional delay for us. Not only did we have all of that, but because of the storm, there was then a queue of planes that to take off. So you could hear the captain, like the captain had to come on one more time, like, okay, we are ready to go. There are 15 planes ahead of us. You can hear them starting to take off. 
we're we're far back. It's gonna be. I don't want to lie to you. Maybe fifteen minutes, but I don't know. <laughs> like, which is which is still amazing. Like we're in a queue. There's a queue for the sky car. Yeah, the, I guess the worst the worst part of the queue though. Uh, this would this would just be the worst part of it because. Because you have a very limited window of which you can you can make sense of the world outside uh, of the plane, um, there would be these constant series of accelerate and then braking and excel- as the plane is moving up the queue to move in. So you never know if you're on the runway yet. And so it's like, oh, maybe this time she's gonna open the. Oh no, there she's braking again. Yeah. yeah. Oh, maybe she's gonna. Oh no, she's braking again. And then finally you hit it, and then you know you're definitely taking off. But there was like that kind of stop start. It's like, well, maybe 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 oh, maybe 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 oh. I get. I, I we had little movies in the front because if they don't give you movies on a transatlantic flight, it turns into Lord of the Flies. Is my understanding. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, my my flight over to you guys, the TVs were broken. Oh, I I was audiobooks and crying most of the way. Mm, yeah. yeah, like I brought stuff to amuse myself, but instead I wound up watching a whole bunch of Agent Carter, <laughs> um, which I'd never seen before, which was really cool because I'm not allowed to watch TV unsupervised. <laughs> but uh, no, the, the the we were all watching these little movies, and I would pause my my little movie on my on my screen, and I would. Sort of look out the window and be like, "Oh, are we leaving? I don't want to miss the takeoff because it's awesome." Yeah, and oh, yeah. I, I would hate to become a person who does not, who's unwilling to pause their movie to watch a giant metal craft that they are inside slip the bonds of Earth and take <laughs> flight. I think that. That is sufficiently momentous enough. Not to mention that whenever we actually take off, my the back of my head, like the primitive lizard brain bit, is just like. <laughs> take off is the best. Part. Take off and landing is. are my favorite parts. I love take off and landing. Like I can but, I can sleep the rest of the plane. I have to be awake for for take off, and I have to be awake for landing, or I get really. Upset. I just I never want that to be ordinary. No, I want that no. to be amazing forever. Yeah. And I, I don't know that it is. Like, I know people who are frequent flyers, and they're like, yeah, whatever, I fall asleep, I wake up, and I'm there. And I'm like, but you're literally flying. That's fantastic. Airports fascinate me because they're this, like, magnificent construction of just moving pieces and parts that somehow get you there. And even when they're at their, like, most complete pain in the ass... They are flying people all over the world, and I'm like, damn. Yep. That was just our icebreaker. <laughs> I was gonna say this episode is probably actually about air travel. Yeah. This episode is not actually about Scotland. Well, do we want to move on to first impressions of Scotland? Yeah, let's do that. I don't remember my first impression of Scotland. Well, you were a baby, so I guess that <laughs> counts. Um. So, no, our first impression. I mean, we got off. We got off the plane. We get out. Where, but really, for me, it was the drive. Um, we're staying in Fife. And uh, the we so we had to drive from Edinburgh to Fife, and Scotland is deeply different to Canada, and yet deeply the same. I mean, we live in Ontario, so there's lots of green, there's lots of farms. You're driving around. I mean, everything's much much further apart because Canada is huge, but you know, there's there's lots of natural things, but. For some reason, I was, like Scotland is very different. The hills are all made of dirt instead of being made of rocks and bullshit. And the, <laughs> you know, they sort of roll. I understand the notion of the rolling hills of Scotland now. Because mm-hmm. um, they just sort of stretch out into this expanse. And you're like, shit. Whereas in Canada, like sometimes you'll get that huge valley. Yeah. Um, with the trees on the horizon. But it's it's more craggy yeah. and hilly. Mm-hmm. Also, it's super, super green. Like, um, there's a lot of trees here, but as far as I know, it's the same. Yeah, but the the fields, um, the fields feel more um, uh, open. Like they're they're farm fields, but they don't feel the same way because our row, like there's definite rows. Or here, there's just tractor rows. Mm-hmm. You know, where the tractors drive up and down the fields. Um, and so, and but even with the grass and whatnot, I mean. The quality of the grass, I was marveling. It, it looks all like what you would see on a putting green. 
super, super fine. Like, you don't see the crabgrass. You don't see the crappy stuff. And, you know, you don't see the weeds, even though all the grass well, is... We also don't have weed, a 40-degree but... summer that burns yeah. away all your cool vegetation. Yeah. Yeah, and like... to be fair, like, Fife is, like, it's a breadbasket of Scotland. But yeah. We've been doing this for hundreds of years. We have the farming thing kind of Soon. down. We've path. been farming for hundreds of years, too. Yeah, but not like we have. Because we, were, you, were you farming in the 1200s? Well, no. Well, shut up then. <laughs> well, we might have been, but we were definitely not in Canada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like, like the our, our way we farm here is this is what it's been for hundreds of years. Yeah, so it is um, stupidly green almost. Um, so that that's different. Yeah. Um, the the road system. I commented today. We were on a, a fairly long car trip, relatively long car trip. Um, I, I commented that in Ontario, I I have a and perhaps because I grew up there, so at least I have a, a sense of direction. But I can't get my bearings here <laughs> from a combination of I can't see the sun. I haven't seen the sun in three days. It's, I'm not gonna lie. It's kind of gray. Yeah, it's, I mean, like, okay, there's, like, rain gray, and then there's just overcast. This is mystery-solving weather, my friend. Yeah, so, so I can't, I can't really get a sense of, of direction, nor apparently of time, because the sun sets after midnight right now. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Like, fully, fully drops below, below the horizon. And it's 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 dawn by four in the morning. Yeah, Yeah. 420 at the latest. So... So, um, so I can't, I can't orientate myself according to the sun, uh, but also Ontario, we've done a fairly good job of building our roads, um, more or less in cross pattern in the sense of like cardinality. Like our highways. Yeah. Our highways, like North, South, East, West, and everything tends to be fairly square. I mean, relatively like 401 drives East to West, but it's kind of Northeast to Southwest, but in general, like, you know which direction you're heading, especially when you have the sun, you know, so, like, you know if you're driving into the sun in the morning, you're, you're heading east kind of deal. But the roads here are kind of, how do I say it, fuck uppity? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that seems fair. Because, because, like, you have roundabouts everywhere, so, as Jim said, they save money on, on lighting or at least uh, turn signals. You don't have turn signals, you have, you have roundabouts everywhere, which is cool. I'm not, I don't have a problem with roundabouts. Um, but you have roundabouts with like five or six exits. Like our roundabouts are almost always crossed. <laughs> like you have the throughway going this way, the throughway going this way, and they're trying to avoid putting a, a traffic light there, right? They're trying to calm traffic yeah. a little bit, right? So, but here you have like five or six, and then you go out one, and then it loops back around. So it should conceivably be driving parallel to another road, but it's not driving parallel to another road. And you get off <laughs> a major... that road has vanished. Yeah, and you drive, like, you're getting off a major highway to get on a major highway, but you don't really know, like, where... Once you get off the roundabout and then curve around to join the highway, you have no idea where the original highway was going relative to where you're going. But thankfully, at least the signs tend to make sense, except the highway numbering system doesn't yet... I don't understand it yet. Like, I, there's like A90, A91, or whatever. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not seeing a rhyme or reason. They're just random numbers attached to the roads. Spoilers. They're numbers right across Britain. So, like, we we have up here was the M74. We have the, the, the M8, the M9, the M90, and the M74. So you're saying it's Britain's fault? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm That's comfortable fair. with that. Also, I like the fact that you were like, oh, roundabouts have like six roads. Like, yeah, because we fucked up and they're all going to hit each other. That's why it's a roundabout there. There's nothing clever about it. <laughs> no, I, I, but that was... No, originally, it was just a pile-up. And then <laughs> they just sort of bury, they poured a bunch of dirt on the pile-up. Yeah, exactly. And put a road around it. <laughs> I mean, no, my... we're like, let's learn from this mistake. <laughs> and, and, like the, and the country roads themselves are very much, they feel like... So in Ontario... We fucking cut through, straight through the land because we're going to lay it about as, as straight as we needed to be in order to cut costs. Here, it's just like it followed the natural wherever, like the lowest part of the road would have been. It just kind of, it all just this way, that way. So again, like I, I can't tell if we're driving in the same direction or if we end up like going this way and then hatchback this way. Um, what else is weird about the road? That's, you know, do you know why that is? Um, Scottish road clearing work and, and road creation works exactly like Canadian road oh, no. creation. The difference is, of course, that um, the person driving is, the uh, the bulldozer is drunk. Thanks, so the thanks. roads sort of <laughs> they just sort of weave. There's there's a bit of, but I think it's also a consequence of just having a lot of natural hills. Oh yeah, and wanting to preserve them. Whereas in yeah. Ontario, we will just 
dig a hole through a hill <laughs> and put a road there. Yeah, and, and I'm not saying, like, I'm not criticizing the road because I think it's wrong or whatever. I'm in, deeply appreciative it's of the fact... It's scenic as fuck. Yeah, I'm deeply appreciative that they didn't disturb, well, I don't know what it was like before, but they seemingly did not disturb the natural beauty there. Um, but also, like, we, we noticed the differences in the roads, like... Uh, in Ontario, everything is cut like four meters. Like all the vegetation is cut back four meters from the road. Uh, Jim smartly pointed out that that's probably because you need the extra visibility for a deer and b fucking blizzard. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also just the room to get the snow off the road. Like. Yeah, yeah. Whereas here, like the vegetation pretty much goes straight up from the road, and then across where the lorries are. Yeah, and then it curves and runs. So like, I don't even know if those were cut by. People, no, or no. if that was the cut tops by of buses. The, the tops of buses, yeah. just fucking plowed straight <laughs> yeah. through everything until eventually it was a nice tunnel shaped. Um, there's no real on the country roads, anyways. There's no real boulevards. Again, like the vegetation kind of grows straight up, or at least in a, in a lot of Ontario roads, there's a little bit of a grassy boulevard that you know if you need to, you can pull off. Um, what else? I just again, like I'm I'm. The highlighting or I'm con contrasting the differences here, but only in so far as it's just cool as hell, and I'm so glad I'm not driving because yeah, <laughs> I, was about, I was about to say, are you enjoying me being on the wrong side of the car driving? Yeah, yeah I, I, that doesn't bother me anymore. No, I I got used to that yeah. after like like every once in a while when I'm distracted and then I look back up, I'm like, whoa. The the, the thing I noticed this morning, uh, so we, we as Huck mentioned, we went on a long uh, car trip today. We'll probably talk about another podcast. Um, but uh, we uh, is I went to get in behind the driver and I got in behind the passenger and I'm like, well, this is where I am now. Yeah. This is where I sit because I I get in and I'm like, there's no steering wheel. Oh yeah, okay. I've seen a couple of times. I don't know if you're doing it intentionally or not, but you've gone towards the car. And you've gone to go in the driver's door yeah. and sort of caught yourself and ran around the yeah. car. When I realized that you're you're the driver going to the driver's side, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll go to the other <laughs> side. Uh, the, the one thing I noticed the first and second days is I think I've have, I have better muscle balance developed on one side of my body than the other because... Whenever I don't have this problem when I get in in North American when the when the drivers or the wheel is on I guess the left side yeah. if you're facing out, I, um when I get into the driver's seat in North America I usually balance myself off the steering wheel and I slide in but when I'm on the passenger side I just plop down it's no yeah. problem but when I had to get in on the driver's side of the Scottish car I actually was like falling into the car and then I'd <laughs> have to like dig myself out of the car to stand up like i have to turn my body sideways and then launch myself out with both arms um because like i didn't have the that's how i get out of literally every car well, yeah. <laughs> uh but I, I i didn't have like the muscle capacity to be able to do it on the first and second day granted the first day i was tired you know we flew in at 9 a.m and then boom we just continued on with the day so um yeah I mean, again we, we say all of this because it's just so fucking cool <laughs> <laughs> everything is cool everything is amazing you know it's vacation you can't really complain well no that's no. true yeah uh, no it's it's the other thing I've been noticing is is much like Canada Scotland has a lot of small towns yep and uh, the difference is that all of this all of the small towns uh, are they 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 are they are old. They look old and they are old. Like yeah. the houses are all made of stone. Yeah. Lots of roofs made of shale. Mm -hmm. I it's everybody told me they're like, hey, you're gonna go see castles when you're in Scotland. I'm like every house is a castle. Yeah. <laughs> in, like, in, they're built from the same stuff. Yeah. In yeah. in Canada, stone houses were more expensive to develop because trees were everywhere. It was so much cheaper. Here, everything is stone. So it just everything looks minimum hundred years old. They probably are. They probably minimum hundred years, but everything just looks old because, by comparison, everything in Ontario that looks that way is all ridiculous. Also, old. if you build a house out of wood in Canada, it'll rot in like I don't know twenty thirty years. Yeah, it'll just fall apart <laughs> around you. No. Do you have termites here? No. Okay. So Jesus. Yeah. Wow. How lucky are you? Are Do mosquitoes here? Midges. Midges are very tiny mosquitoes who are incredibly annoying. Travel in massive swarms and wait until you're not looking to pounce. We may experience some. Sounds like MRAs. Not it. It does sound like MRAs. <laughs> oh, that's a different podcast too. But I'm excited to do that one. But uh, 
Catch us again for uh, a special edition of the podcast uh, this weekend, uh, where we will talk about people and places and some of the food we're eating in, in Scotland, some of the places we're going. Um, but for now, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I'm Theo. We're signing off. Stay awesome! What was that? That was the worst. <laughs> okay, you know that. Stay awesome! Stay awesome. 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 Uh, now you sound Australian. Oh! Awesome. Oi! Oh.